Well, let me uh, join Chancellor Bergno in welcoming you all to this symposium. It's a great privilege for me to be able to moderate today's discussion. Uh, in fact, I feel a bit like Scandinavian royalty, since uh, apart from the King of Sweden, uh, there aren't really very many people who get to share the stage with five Nobel laureates. Um, <laughs> Now, their Nobel Prizes are first and foremost tributes to the extraordinary accomplishments of these extraordinarily distinguished scholars. But the fact that Berkeley has had so many Nobel laureates on its faculty is also a tribute to the people of California and to their determination to build and sustain a public university that is the equal of any private university in the world. That, too, is a truly remarkable achievement which we honor and celebrate today. Of course, uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention what some of you may not know, which is that Nobel Prize winners on this campus are given their own personal parking spaces. <laughs> so what the fact that we have so many Nobel Prize winners may really demonstrate is the desperate lengths to which some people will go to get a parking place around here. The program for today's event will be as follows. Uh, each of the five Nobel laureates will speak for about 15 minutes. They'll speak in the order in which they won their awards. After all of them have spoken, we'll have time for a few questions from the audience, and then all of you are invited to join the speakers for a reception in the lobby. Uh, I'll begin with some very brief introductions of the five speakers, uh, although I could probably use up most of our time today by describing their many honors and accomplishments, the purpose of this occasion is to allow you to hear from the speakers rather than about them. Seated closest to me is Professor Donald Glazer, who received his PhD from Caltech in 1950. He began his academic career at the University of Michigan, where he rose rapidly through the ranks to become professor of physics in 1957. He joined the Berkeley faculty as a visiting professor of physics in 1959, and he has remained here ever since with permanent professorial appointments both in the Department of Physics and in the Department of Molecular and Cell Biology. Although Professor Glazer retired from full-time teaching in 1994, he remains active as a professor in the graduate school. Donald Glazer was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1960. Seated next to Professor Glazer is Charles Towns. Professor Towns was already a Nobel laureate and a scientific and academic leader when in 1967 Berkeley lured him away from MIT, where in addition to being professor of physics, he had served as provost for five years. Here at Berkeley, he held the title of university professor of physics until his retirement in 1986. Like Professor Glazer, he remains active as a professor in the graduate school. Earlier this year, he was awarded the Templeton Prize for his work on the relation between science and religion, an award that I believe was presented to him by the Duke of Edinburgh at Buckingham Palace in May. In July, Professor Towns celebrated his 90th birthday, and the university will hold a three-day symposium in his honor next week. Charles Towns was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1964. Seated next to Professor Towns is Stephen Chu, Dr. Chu is a source of particular pride to this institution because he's the only one of today's panelists to have received his doctorate from Cal. <laughs> After receiving his PhD in physics in 1976, he had to endure an extended period of exile from Berkeley, <laughs> first at Bell Labs and then at an institution of higher learning in Palo Alto whose name escapes him. <laughs> But in 2004, we were thrilled to welcome him back as director of the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory and professor of physics and molecular and cell biology. Stephen Chu was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1997. Seated next to Professor Chu is Daniel McFadden. Professor McFadden is the E. Morris Cox Professor of Economics and the director of Berkeley's Econometrics Laboratory. After brief teaching stints at the University of Minnesota and the University of Pittsburgh, he came to Berkeley as an assistant professor in 1963 and remained here until 1979, at which time he left to take up a position at MIT. Luckily for us, however, this story, like Professor Chu's, had a happy ending <laughs> since we were able to persuade Professor McFadden to return to Berkeley in 1991, and we certainly don't plan to let him get away again. 
Daniel McFadden was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics in 2000. Finally, George Akerlof, Berkeley's most recent Nobel laureate, is the Daniel E. Koshlin Senior Distinguished Professor of Economics. Professor Akerlof received his PhD from MIT in 1966, and he arrived in Berkeley as an assistant professor that same year. Like all of today's speakers, he's been showered with honors and awards throughout his career, and his receipt of the Nobel Prize just one year after it was awarded to his colleague, Dan McFadden, gave Berkeley's economics department the remarkable distinction of having back-to-back -back Nobel Prize winners. George Akerlof was awarded the Nobel Prize in economics in 2001. I will now turn the microphone over to our first speaker, Professor Donald Glazer. Sam forgot another advantage <clears throat> of having a Nobel Prize in Berkeley, which is that I was able to change fields and didn't publish anything for two years, and yet the chancellor did not fire me. <laughs> I've been uh, teaching at various universities, if you include being TA, for almost 60 years, uh, 46 of them here in Berkeley and counting. Uh, and I feel I've learned more from the students than they've learned from me. And so I'm going to tell you not about my career, but I'm going to tell you what I learned from the students. And what it is is related to the general theme of uh, today's meeting and of the uh, celebration in the Exploratorium, namely a uh, hundred years of creativity. And I'm going to raise the question, what is creativity? And who gets it? I have observed many very, very bright students, some of whom even worked hard. <laughs> and some of them were extremely creative, and some of them much less creative. And the question is, what is the difference between the ones that were creative and the ones that weren't? Uh, in order to answer that question, let's see, how do I get this to be big? Let's fill the screen. Yes, sorry. Okay. No, that doesn't do it. Oh, fine. Thank you. <clears throat> and so I'm going to end up with a list of 10 traits that, in my observation, the most creative students had, and colleagues. Uh, so first, I start with my own sort of homemade definition of what creativity is. It's the ability to produce something novel, and valuable. So the definition means that you have to produce something. Now, the slippery part of that is how do you judge whether something is novel and valuable? And the answer I give is it's judged by experts in the field. And that's slippery. It changes with cultures, it changes with time, it changes with fields. Uh, nevertheless, it's the only definition I could think of that most of us would agree to and which doesn't lead to much controversy, at least in modern science. So here are the 10 traits that I've noticed uh, to be uh, common among the creative ones of my students. First one is a strong ambition, fire in the belly, if you like, to produce something which is considered novel and valuable. The second one is the willingness to take risks it's much easier to do what is well known, and all that requires is competence. But uh, to, to take risks is required to be innovative. And, that, and the innovation has many steps that I'll describe, <clears throat> most of them involving wild guesses. So knowledge in the field of interest is something very important, or the ability to acquire that knowledge. Ignorant geniuses rarely succeed in science. And, and, and if you visit, if you visit uh, Telegraph Avenue, you, you, you will see plenty of data. <clears throat> the next requirement for innovation in my, I'm not a philosopher, I'm not an expert in sociology, but I think the independence to challenge tradition. And that takes judgment. Which traditions can you ignore? <laughs> and that's a gamble. 
but nearly every major innovation has required uh, ignoring the received wisdom of the time to break some dogma. Next comes imagination. Dreaming is a lovely form of it. It involves very often making novel extensions of known ideas and facts or distortions. And that includes crazy ideas. Uh, there's, a, there's this wonderful story about the famous Danish physicist Niels Bohr. His graduate student uh, had an appointment with uh, Professor Bohr and said, well, I uh, solved the problem you gave me uh, last week, but it looks awfully crazy. And Bohr said, well, young man, let's see if it's crazy enough. <laughs> and so the ability to generate crazy ideas fast, a lot of them, uncritically, but dependent on real knowledge is a very important thing, fantasy. <coughs> but you have to throw out the bad ones quickly because they will be, <laughs> they'll be in the majority. And so the ability, which I call taste or intuition, to recognize quickly which are the bad ideas in order to concentrate energy on the ones that look promising. And so I call that perseverance the ability to then look at the ones that, that survived the craziness filter and see which ones are worth working on. And then finally, it takes real skill, that is professional ability in the field, to actually produce something from the ideas which look promising. In modern science, particularly in experimental sciences, uh, large groups are required. I quit working in high energy physics because the last paper I was one of the authors on had 23 authors. <laughs> and that was before the internet. So I actually had to fly to Geneva to meet with my colleagues and decide whether our data were compatible enough that we could pool them and get a, a reasonable result. In high energy physics, which is my old field, there are now 2,000 names of physicists on a typical paper. I, I don't see how they live, uh, but, but that's how it is. And, and so the names are not even given in the journal. You have to go to the website uh, to find them. But that's not true in theoretical science. There's still a lot of brilliant solo performances. The last and very important <laughs> trade is to be lucky. And that's required because you're making guesses all along the way. None of them are sure things. One of the, the things that you have to get right is to attack the right problem when it's ripe. And then you have to make mostly lucky guesses. And then finally, the other side of the luck coin is the ability to admit that you failed and it didn't work. <laughs> and you have to start over. <clears throat> My thesis advisor told me most of his graduate students do their thesis over and over again for the rest of their pro professional lives. Uh, so luck is very important. Finally, here's the take home lesson. <laughs> End point. I don't know how we're doing for time. I have some time. Okay, then I'll tell you a little bit about the Nobel Prize. Uh, the problem that I was interested in was the question of what is everything made of? And all of us were taught in school as children that the universe is made out of electrons and protons and neutrons. But then we noticed that some protons hit our atmosphere from somewhere outside perhaps even outside the galaxy, with enormous speed and energy. And when those protons hit a molecule of air, oxygen or nitrogen, a spray of things came out, eight or 10 or 20 things. And most of them were not protons, neutrons, or electrons. They were new things that had been created by this high energy collision. And we got one of these weird events, oh, a week, every week or so, and you could even do all the relativistic calculations with a slide rule in those days, because you were in no hurry. You weren't going to have another one for some time. 
And some of these particles had such weird and unpredicted behavior that they were called strange particles. And they had other names. Finally, by the time, uh, so, so I built this thing called a bubble chamber uh, in order to increase the rate of seeing these interesting events. And I did by about a factor of a thousand. And so people all over the world built things like mine, the so-called bubble chamber. And uh, together, we generated about 130 new particles. It, um, you know, you mesons, quarks, uh, baryons, leptons, you've seen all those funny names. Uh, and so the universe suddenly became more complicated by one way of measuring. But by another way of measuring, what we had was a gigantic jigsaw puzzle. And we couldn't see the picture until we had most of the pieces. And it's getting better all the time. But that's when the 2,000 names on a paper began. And uh, so I quit long before that. <laughs> And then I began to be more interested in biology. And what I work on now is uh, the human visual system. It's about one third of our brain, and it's the best known part. We actually know the wiring diagram pretty well for that part of the brain. What we don't know is what are the messages that are being shipped around from place to place in the brain that allow us to see and to know what we're seeing. So that's what I work on. I make up stories about what these messages might be, and then I make predictions about uh, what 10 healthy undergraduates in the lab would see. A and we try them out on ourselves, the postdocs and the graduate students and I. And if it really is a good test, uh, then uh, the undergraduates pile up lots of data and it either agrees with my guess at, a, at an understanding or it doesn't. If it agrees, we publish it. If not, we try again. <laughs> We've been working lately on an extremely interesting illusion in which you look at a painting, a particular one, an oil painting, and you see, seem to see rotation. Nothing is moving, but you see it looks like water is running around in this picture. But if you've had three glasses of red wine, <laughs> you don't see it anymore. <laughs> you still see the picture. So one of my students is in Novosibirsk now. Uh, he's a Russian a boy to meet his uh, future in-laws. And so he's trying to see what the effect of vodka is. <laughs> We have a collaboration with a group at UCSF who are studying the possible utility of marijuana for controlling uh, pain in cancer and AIDS patients. And for every two hour interview with their patients, we get 15 minutes with our little laptop to see whether people see things spinning around or not. And sure enough, the, the, the uh, people uh, who are stoned or partly stoned uh, uh, have less acute visual perceptions. But we won't really know who was given a big dose and who was given a small dose until they analyze the blood samples, which will be in a couple of weeks. Anyway, uh, it's a funny way of trying to get at how different parts of the brain communicate and whether uh, arousal suppressants like alcohol and marijuana can reduce the noise and thereby eliminate these noise-induced illusions. Well, that's a quick summary. Thank you very much. <laughs> Professor Towns. As a youngster, I was very interested in natural history, the birds and the animals and the stars and the wonderful universe around us. Uh, and I took my first course in physics. I said, oh, that's it, because physics allows you to be quantitative and decide what's right and what isn't right and so on. And oh, that's it. I, I can try to figure out things, figure out how this universe works and so on. Uh, so that was a great thing. And I just feel very privileged of have had a career in physics. It's uh, just such a pleasure. I never work. I just have a good time doing it. <laughs> uh, now, um, after I got my degree, I um, 
thought I saw a new way of doing things. Radar had originally come along, and uh, we were making a lot of microwaves. Engineers knew how to make microwaves. These are waves from old wavelengths that long down to about this long. And I thought we could study molecules and examine them. And so I started doing that with a new technology from radar. I'd worked on radar during the war. I became an engineer, something of an engineer, and that was a great advantage to me. Um, so I used microwaves to try to study molecules. I could flip the molecules. The molecules vibrate and rotate and so on. I could flip them around and move them and see how they worked. Thereby measure just where the atoms were and how they're placed. Measure the shape of the atoms, shape of the nuclei. Nuclei of atoms, you know, are not necessarily round. First place, they're spinning and they may be somewhat on, uh, uh, elongated uh, uh, and uh, are squashed. And I can measure the shape of these nuclei and the spins and the shapes of the molecules and where the atoms are placed. And that was just great. My students and I had a wonderful time making all kinds of measurements like that. As we went along, I said, oh, well, I'd, I'd like to get down to waves that are shorter because I see some new things we can do with these molecules and atoms. If I could get down to shorter waves, we can do study, study new things. So how can we get to shorter waves? Electronics could produce waves down maybe, oh, a, a quarter of an inch or something like that, but not much more, not much shorter. I wanted to be shorter waves. And I kept thinking about it. My students and I tried things that didn't work terribly well, uh, but we had some nice ideas, we thought. And then I was appointed chairman of a national committee to examine all over the country and in Europe, does anybody have any good ideas to produce short waves? I didn't find anything. The last meeting of our committee was in Washington, D.C. And I woke up early in the morning worrying about it. I went out and sat on the park bench because breakfast wasn't ready yet. It was nice sunshine. Why hadn't been able to think of an idea, a way of getting to shorter waves? And I went through all the ideas it covered. Well, molecules can do short waves. They oscillate very fast. They can do short waves. But to make them produce energy, you have to heat them up. To heat them up, to produce more energy, you have to heat them up so, f so much they fall apart. That's uh, thermodynamics. Thermodynamics, well, yes, I knew thermodynamics. I was proud to do that, but I could show, well, you have to heat them up and they would fall apart too bad. <laughs> Hey, wait a minute, wait a minute now. Molecules don't have to be described by thermodynamics. Thermodynamics says, well, some molecules have low energy, some molecules have high energy. To produce many of them with high energy, you've got to give them a lot of heat. But maybe we can just pick out molecules, all of which are, have high energy. Oh, hey, and somebody else at Columbia University where I was at had been doing that in beams of molecules. They deflected them with electric fields and picked out molecules in certain states. Hey, wait a minute. We can get molecules all in excited states, lots of energy, and then we send a wave past them and get take the energy from them and they will give up energy at these short waves. Oh, boy. And I wrote it down. I, I knew all the numbers and I wrote it down on a piece of paper in an envelope. Said, well, it looks like it really would work. Well, I was very excited, but I didn't, I wasn't absolutely sure it would work, and so I didn't mention it to the committee. The committee, we ended, we hadn't been able to find anything. We ended our report to the government. No, nobody had any answers. Um, I went back home, and I tried to get a student to work on this. I got a very good student, Jim Gordon, who was willing to work on this to do a thesis. So we worked and worked. We worked for a couple of years. And now, you know, most new, I many new ideas, and other people don't like them. I was new to them. The new idea is frequently turned down by other people. Oh, well, that's crazy, and so on. Well, we'd worked on this for a couple of years trying to do it. We hadn't succeeded yet. I thought we'd succeed. But the chairman of the department and the previous chairman of the department came to my office and sat down. Look, you've got to stop. That's not going to work. You know it's not going to work. We know it's not going to work. You've got to stop. Well, fortunately, I had tenure. That's very important. <laughs> Very important in universities. I had tenure. I said, no, I think, I thought about it hard. I think it has a chance of working. I'm going to continue. Well, they marched out of my office angrily. About two months, we had it working. Well, they weren't trying to pick on me. They came in and congratulated me. Oh, boy. And then it hit the newspapers and so on. Now, before that, nobody else was trying. And people would come to my lab. Oh, well, yeah, that's a kind of an interesting idea. But nobody tried to compete at all. Once it was going, and everybody was doing it. Now, the growth of physics has a lot to do, growth of any science, has a lot to do with a lot of many different con contributors. And you talk with people, and they get ideas from you, you get ideas from them, and so on. So this became a matter of, became a matter of great discussion. A lot of people contributing, and the whole field grew and grew. Uh, 
But we were making microwaves. We were making, at that time, I tried, I tried to produce first microwaves because I thought that'd be the easiest thing to do. Then I wanted later to get on down to very short waves. Most people didn't think you'd get down to very short waves. But after a few years, I said, no, I've got to get on down to short waves. And I sat down to try to think about it again. I said, well, oh, I wrote down the equation. Hey, it looks like we can get to even light waves. Light waves are oh, uh, 10,000 times shorter than the microwaves. Get down to light waves even. Oh, boy. And I went home, wrote this down in a notebook, and I was consulting with Bell Telephone Laboratories then. I went out there. My brother-in-law, Arthur Charlotte, was there. He'd been a postdoc with me and uh, married my kid sister, who I was pleased about. And uh, we trade ideas. Everybody trades ideas. Uh, interchange of ideas is, a, is, a, is a very important in science. And I talk with Art about it and says, well, you know, I've been wondering about that too. And hey, um, could I, could we do this together? Sure. Well, so we worked on together. And he, he produced the idea of uh, making two flat mirrors like this with the light bouncing back and forth. I saw how to produce, some, produce molecules with excess energy. And I was going to put them in a cavity. But the light waves, the light going back and forth was his idea. So uh, we wrote a patent on this and uh, published it. And then everybody jumped in and was working on it. And the first one was produced. All, all the first lasers are produced in the industry. The ideas, the new ideas frequently come from universities. Once an idea is clear and important, then industry jumps in and industry can spend a lot of energy on it. And so all the new lasers were built by industry. But I wanted, I was, I did it as a scientific tool. I wanted to make a scientific tool for which we could do new science. That was my interest. And when we first had the idea, and we had it patented, many people said, well, that's a nice idea, but what good is it? What can it do for us? It's a cute idea. What good, what good is it? Well, I saw some things it could do. Communications, it seemed to me pretty obvious. Communications. A light wave, such a high frequency, you can use a very large bandwidth, and you can put essentially all the telephone calls in the world on one light wave, in principle. <laughs> and now, you know, the light waves are sent through little filaments, uh, and uh, we can transmit a lot of, a lot of different uh, information on one light wave going through a filament. And that's a, that's a very important uh, aspect of communication these days. In fact, uh, when, when companies began building filaments to transmit light waves from place to place, the amount of information it could transfer became so great, these companies had to back off. They had too many. <laughs> Too much. <laughs> well, the communications we need and want and so on will grow and grow, and so I'm sure it will, uh, it will continue to grow in the long run. But I, I want it as a scientific tool, and I'm very pleased that um, a number of Nobel Prizes have been awarded which use the laser as a tool, as a scientific tool. Now, you know, I'm sure, the various, uh, various uh, uh, industrial applications of lasers. You cut and weld with it. Yeah, there's a lot of medical applications. Medical applications, again, you never know what's going to happen with new ideas. Uh, and uh, a doctor asked me, could he, with me, write a paper on possible medical, medical applications of lasers? I said, oh, yes, I'd be happy to do that. And we wrote a paper. I think we had some good ideas. But we didn't have one of the very best first ideas that came along was reattaching detached retina. And I'm so moved when a friend comes to me and tells, look, the laser saved my eyes. They're reattaching the attached retina. Well, we didn't mention that. Why? I never heard of the attached retina. <laughs> <laughs> the doctor didn't mention it to me. <laughs> well, that's, uh, you see, new ideas. Other people have to add on and so on. <laughs> and um, so lots of medical applications, lots of industrial applications, communications, and so on. A lot of scientific applications, and I'm especially, especially pleased with that. Now, in fact, um, one of the things I'm doing now is astrophysics, astronomy. My general uh, psychology is such that, well, I like to try to do new things, explore new things that I feel are being missed. And the laser was one of them at the time. I felt it was being missed. Molecules, studying molecules in the shapes of atoms, I felt it was being missed at the time. Once the field becomes popular, however, lots of people working on it, well, there are a lot of good people, and they don't need me, and uh, i rather move on to something I think is being missed. And so I moved into astrophysics, particularly infrared. 
which I felt wasn't being done at that time. Now it's a very popular field. Now I'm trying to study the size of stars using infrared radiation. I'm using lasers as a tool, and I'm studying the size of stars. And so I moved on, I moved from one thing to another, having a good time, <laughs> always. Uh, and I'm just delighted uh, with the, the fact that the laser has, uh, has had so many important industrial and human applications, but very delighted it's, it's become an important scientific tool. It can do things for us which, uh, which we couldn't do before. Now, I think Don has given an excellent talk about creativity and new ideas. Frequently new ideas are things that seem obvious after, once they've been developed, the laser is so obvious, there was no single new idea in the laser. All the idea, everything, every principle involved had been known for some time. <coughs> it was just putting them together. It was a combination of engineering and science that was required. And I'd had some engineering background. Engineers didn't know much quantum mechanics at that time. Physicists weren't terribly interested in oscillators. Putting those things together, you see, the cross fields and the interaction between people, that's, uh, that's very important. But also show you how new ideas sometimes uh, get looked at askance. When we first, when we had the first system going, which I called a MESA, that was microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. MESA, I, that was the first one we made, because I made microwaves first, and then later light, light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, that's a laser. Some of my students liked, the, liked that, and they said, well, what about an eraser for infrared amplification by stimulated emission of radiation? <laughs> well, erasers <laughs> uh, might be a little misleading if you use that. <laughs> Uh, but anyhow, when we got the first maser going, uh, I knew Niels Bohr's son, who was an excellent physicist. He also has a Nobel Prize, as Niels Bohr himself had. Niels Bohr is one of our most famous physicists, a wonderful person. And I was visiting his son, and I was walking along the street with Niels Bohr. He asked me, what are you doing? He said, well, I have this new device we're calling a maser. It uh, uses molecules to amplify. And the oscillation gives a very, very pure frequency. We send a molecule through a cavity, produce a very pure frequency. Oh, he said, no, that's not possible. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's, that, that can't be. You must misunderstand. I'm sure he was thinking about something called the uncertainty principle. <laughs> the molecules stay in the cavity only a short time, and so you can't define the frequency very well. He was thinking about the uncertainty principle. Oh, he said, no, that can't be. And I said, no, you have it working. Look, it's it. And I said, oh, well, maybe you're right, but I don't think you ever believed it. <laughs> Another physicist, John von Neumann, a wonderful mathematical physicist, from the same thing. I was at the cocktail party at Princeton, and he said, what are you doing? I told him, oh, no, no, that can't be right. No, you can't. No, that's impossible. <laughs> no, you haven't. Well, he went off and got another cocktail. Fifteen minutes later, hey, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, now it's obvious to everybody. Thank goodness. <laughs> it's so obvious. So come on. Why didn't we get this idea before? Could have occurred 20 years before. Well, we have to explore. And that's the fun of science. Students of science and so on. Explore and think about things and imagine things and explore and do new things. And they're frequently very useful. So it's great fun and I just feel very lucky to uh, have had an opportunity to have a career in science. Thank you. Professor Chu. Well, I don't know how I can follow that, but I just want to add a little postscript to um, the story you just heard. Um, Charlie was trying to get um, high frequency radiation so he could study molecules, but in the end he inverted the problem around and used molecules to get high frequency radiation. And he was very conscious of that, that morning I've been told. <laughs> um, the, there's another thing that, from the first two um, little talks that you heard, there's, there's a, perhaps a misconception about Nobel Prizes in physics. You think of Einstein and Dirac and Heisenberg. It turns out most of the Nobel Prizes in physics are for experimental work. And of the experimental work, many of them, maybe even the majority, I haven't really looked, uh, are, have to do with applying physics to develop a new tool. 
and this is true both of Don Glazer and his bubble chamber, and other Nobel Prizes were spawned off that basic tool. I, I don't know really how many, and with uh, Professor Towns, at least a dozen Nobel Prizes uh, came out of the invention of, of the laser, including my own. And, um, and so I think that pleased the scientists more than just about anything else. There are two things. One is that uh, the work is eventually useful for society, but, but first, it's useful for other fields of science. And so um, with that, I, I guess I should say a little bit about, uh, we were told to talk about how you got interested in science and things like that. It, it wasn't quite as clean as uh, Charlie's, I, I had kind of checkered youth, um, so I, I played, <laughs> I played with chemistry sets, I made matchstick rockets, I made yeah. bombs. Um, <laughs> um, all the things you're not supposed to do anymore, and, uh, and I, luckily I still have all my fingers. Uh, and it wasn't until high school um, that I was introduced uh, with a really gifted high school teacher to physics, and I had him again the next year in my senior in high school. And I really thought that was great until I went to college, and, and in my sophomore year in college, I had a less gifted teacher and went into math. <laughs> so, um, but, in, but in the end, I graduated with, in, in mathematics and physics. Now, um, in terms of, I, I again started, uh, because it was mathematics and physics, I thought I would surely be a theoretical physicist, and in fact, when I was a student here, I was actually um, given a theoretical problem as a starting graduate student. And I, um, my advisor was a very patient person, would come in and say, well, how, how are you doing? And I said, well, not much. And you know, after a few months of this, he would come in and, and he was looking more and more disappointed. And what I didn't tell him was I began sneaking into an empty lab of his and uh, trying to do an experiment um, that had to do with this so-called uncertainty principle. The experiment was very simple. I like music and I noticed that if you hear a very fast run on a violin passage where, where perhaps the musician didn't hit all the notes, you could actually tell that the note being played was not really the right note. It was a little off key or something like that. And I said, well, but if you do a little estimate, this seems to violate a basic physics principle. You hear the tone for a certain amount of time, therefore you should be able to hear, uh, pick out um, uh, what frequency it is, but the shorter the time, the more uncertain you would have on the frequency, and it just didn't make any sense. So I just set up an experiment, got some of my friends, um, we gave them a little beep of a pure tone, and then told them to adjust the knob until they thought that the frequency of that tone was, was what they heard. And, and I would shorten the beep better and better, and I found several things. So there was a, one friend who was actually played in the Oakland <laughs> Symphony uh, in his spare time. He was a graduate student here at Berkeley, but he was a member of the Oakland Symphony. Boy, he could find the center of those notes, even when it sounded to me like a click. Um, and he violated this principle by about a factor of 10. And I had two friends like that, and I had two other friends that were completely tone deaf. <laughs> And, I, and, I, and, and, and so I, I went and, and got my advisor and showed him this, and he kind of was looking at me like, this wasn't the astrophysics problem I assigned you. <laughs> so, um, so I had a little chat with him and said, well, maybe I should do experimental work. Um, and so, so that continued, and uh, it went from uh, high energy physics type experiments and atomic physics, and, and I kind of drifted around. <laughs> And when I was at Bell Laboratories, I um, uh, got introduced to the problem that got the Nobel Prize by a uh, really brilliant and elder scientist. At the time, he was in his middle 60s, and, and he had been trying to get this thing to work, this thing being he wanted to hold on to atoms with a laser beam, just to hold on to it by remote control the way you know a tractor beam might hold on to uh, a starship. Um, and, uh, except, you know, he's thinking smaller, and he was be, would have been happier with atoms. And earlier, about 15 years earlier, he could l actually levitate a small glass sphere and hold it up against gravity. And so he was trying to get this to work in atoms. But the work had been shut down for about four or five years um, by uh, the then director of the laboratory because it really wasn't going anywhere, and he was really encouraged, why don't you do something else after about 12 years uh, of thinking about this, on and off, he wasn't he wasn't he wasn't not publishing for 12 years. <laughs> um, 
and uh, I began to look at it uh, only because he was talking to me socially, and I said, well, this is kind of interesting problem. It looks like a lot of fun. And as I began to think about it more and more, uh, I finally decided, you know, management was right to shut it down. <laughs> it looked completely impossible. Uh, the idea is you can hold on to the atom and then use light to actually cool it down to very low temperatures. And the uh, solution to the problem was embarrassing. It was, uh, it was one winter, um, there was a snowstorm and they said everybody at the lab should go home because there was a snowstorm and I thought that was great because everybody left and I could work. Uh, because at that time I was a department head and you know, I could, things would settle down. And, um, and so during this, this afternoon, um, it was one of those does, let's reverse the order. Why not try to slow it down and after you slow it down it will be really easy to trap. And then, then I, the next day, it wasn't a eureka where it all unfolded. It kind of dribbled out over a period of a few days. And then the next day, I said, well, you know what? If you slow it down, maybe it's not going to go very far, so it's almost like a trap. So imagine a group of atoms being surrounded in all sides by light, and they're kind of going back and forth. Uh, but it looks like a little friction. So I said, okay, I can make a quick estimate of, of, of this little atom being jostled back and forth. I said, well, maybe I should write a computer program to figure out really what it's doing. So I'm not a very good computer program. I'm okay, but I started writing the computer program. And, um, and after about the second or third line of code, I said, wait a minute, I've seen this problem before. <laughs> and the problem is that if you put a little particle in water, the, if you try to move the particle around, there's a viscous drag that slows down the particle. And at the same time, the random forces of the water on the particle make it jiggle around. And so how long it will stay in a particular position was figured out long ago by Einstein. So, so I said, yeah, I've seen this problem before. And I just went to my textbook and said, yeah, that's the answer, all right. <laughs> and, and now it turned out then, um, so I got very excited. I went to um, my boss, uh, who was the previous director of Lawrence Berkeley Lab. And I said, well, I think I want to do this. I, and and this, this idea is so simple, it's got to work. It won't fail. Because remember, there's been about five years of pretty concentrated work, and it wasn't succeeding. So he kind of looked at me and said, OK, Steve, you earned the right to fail. <laughs> but don't talk anyone else into failing with you. <laughs> and I said, OK. I was allowed to use my technician and my postdoc, but I was forbidden to recruit anybody else, including the people who had worked on the problem for about five or 10 years, in, in some cases, 10 years. Uh, so I said, all right, I'll, I'll, I'll keep the promise. And then um, so I immediately ran around trying to rouse up the equipment, the vacuum can and everything. And uh, um, I was very motivated because I thought this was such a great idea. I was bound to work. And within one year from that winter, uh, I started to sit down and write the first draft of the paper. Uh, and it, it worked. Now, as I started to write the first draft of the paper, I should also say the last three or four months of this work, I said, hey guys, come on board. Even though we were forbidden not to, it's going to work. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so uh, one of the, the real pioneer in this, in my mind, Art Ashkin, uh, said he, uh, who had had a lot of these ideas, he wasn't really an experimentalist in that area. But, but as I started to write the paper, he said, you know, there's a paper I think you should read. It was written by these two fellows. Uh, one was Arthur Chow, the co-inventor of the laser, and another was uh, Ted Hench. I said, maybe it had something to do with what you just did. So I read the paper. and. I was crestfallen. It had everything to do with what I just did. Uh, in two pages, it, it was laid out. Um, and it became reference number one. <laughs> uh, and um, now there's a, there's, an, there's a funny anecdote to that as well. Um, I, I got to be good friends later with Archello. Uh, he lured me to Stanford from Bell Laboratories. and um, And he got a Nobel Prize for his contributions to laser spectroscopy in, I think it was 1985 or 86, somewhere around that, that time. And no, it was in 1981. And he wrote the paper in 1975. 
And the work, the experimental paper, the, the first of a series of papers that led to this Nobel Prize came out in 1984. And, or 85, 10 years later. And so now, so let's get the timing right. The paper came out in 1974. We did the work in 19, or 1975. We did the work in 1985. He got a Nobel Prize in 1981. In his Nobel Prize lecture in 1981, he talked about all the wonderful things he and his colleagues had done in laser spectroscopy. That, and so it was a, a bulk of work that led to a Nobel Prize. He didn't mention this work, the proposal. I said, Art, you didn't even mention it. You didn't. You, you footnoted yourself 30 times. You didn't even mention this. So he looked at me and said, in 1981, I didn't know it was going to amount to anything. <laughs> so, so this is one of the really great things about science is that you sometimes can't really tell when things are going to be important. I knew a few of the applications that were going to follow, the, being able to cool, cool atoms down to very, very low temperatures. Now. Um, uh, below a billionth of a degree above absolute zero. It's the coldest temperatures uh, possible in science. It led to another Nobel Prize in that this, many of the techniques that I and my colleagues and, and, and people uh, who shared the Nobel Prize with me, um, it led to the ability to make atoms fall into a particular state that all these atoms would actually have the same velocity and the same position and the same everything. So it's not like they're side by side. They're exactly the same. In fact, a laser is that. It gets all the particles of light to fall into a state where all the particles of light have the same direction, the same frequency, the same everything. And so we don't really know what's going to come out of the ability to make these atom states or atom lasers. Um, but I, we think maybe that will come to pass too. So the last couple minutes, I, I just wanted to tell you a, uh, a little story about about you know people ask me what is it like to get a Nobel Prize and aren't your parents proud of you? <laughs> um, so I I was um, I was woken up uh, not by an official call but from by but by a, a call from a radio station. They couldn't get through to me because because the area code had just changed and they knew about it, but the call was from Sweden. Somehow, some, the exchange wasn't smooth. It wouldn't have happened if they hadn't broken up AT&T, but... <laughs> <laughs> but... But in any case, um, so they couldn't get hold of me. I got a, a, a phone call uh, that night around 3.30 or 4. And, um, and luckily, and I didn't know whether it was a crank call or not, and, uh, but luckily the, the day before, the people at Stanford said, well, in case you get a call, this is what we want you to do. Uh, so I said, you know something I don't know? I said, no, 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 we just we take these precautions. So I, I said, okay. So I called them up, and, they, and uh, the person on the, on the news uh, press uh, said, uh, no, it's true. I just read it on the internet. And I said, you believe everything you read on the internet? <laughs> And so, uh, so then what happened is all the, uh, the television crews came and five o'clock in the morning, it was still dark, uh, and they all of a sudden lit up the front of the house, which is on Stanford campus with these huge floodlights, and it looked like a police raid. <laughs> <laughs> they were gonna drag me off. Uh, and, and then I said, well, maybe about seven o'clock, maybe I should call my mother, tell her. And so she said, oh, hello, this is Stephen. Oh, when are you gonna come visit me? <laughs> After I said, Mom, I just want to tell you I won the Nobel Prize, and that's the first thing she said. <laughs> and, uh, and she said, and that's nice, click. <laughs> <laughs> she calls up a few hours later and says, well, I, uh, you, you just woke me up, so I wasn't really sure. <laughs> But now there are still lingering doubts to this day, and, and partly because uh, I, I come from a family of three brothers, and the eldest brother, of course, is the number one son, and I'm the middle one. And, uh, and he was actually, uh, he set the highest cumulative grade in the record of this high school, which is a very good high school in Long Island. And when I came along, they said, oh, we can expect the same from you, but it, it wasn't quite that way. I was a little more rebellious and uh, there are certain subjects like German I just didn't want to work at and uh, so I got C pluses in German which was just I don't know it was horrible uh, <laughs> and but they were deserved C pluses if you ever heard me try to speak in German uh, and and 
uh, in the end, uh, my older brother, you know, had, has a very distinguished education. He got a PhD in physics. He got a PhD in biochemistry. Got an MD, and he's now a professor at Stanford in the medical school uh, and in biochemistry and a college in biochemistry. But the younger brother is the smartest. Um, he got a PhD when he was 21 and went on to get a law degree at Harvard and became uh, the managing partner of a very prestigious law firm in LA before he was 40. Uh, and I was the poor kid left behind. <laughs> and it kind of leveled the playing field, I hope. <laughs> But my mother really hasn't gotten over this, uh, the fact that Gilbert didn't get the Nobel Prize. Stephen did. It just, it, it uh, still doesn't compute to this day. My father kind of, you know, dealt with it and, could, you know, could get comfortable with it. But, uh, and so I remember my wife and I were visiting my mother. She's now 84, uh, a couple weeks ago. And she kind of looks at me and says, you know, well, Gilbert's really a very good scientist, but um, he doesn't pay attention to politics and everything, and so that's really why he didn't get a Nobel Prize. <laughs> So the answer is you can never make your parents happy. <laughs> Professor McFadden. Economics is thought of as one of the most calculating of subjects, and economic theories are founded on the idea that people have well-defined self-interest and consistently behave to maximize their self-interest. Uh, in uh, 1789, Jeremy Bentham said, my notion of man is that he aims at happiness in everything he does. Uh, some economists uh, even take this to extremes, uh, explaining behavior as a uh, tautologically advancing self-interest. And the first thing I put up here is a quote from an economist in 1912 named Tossig essentially says that if you did it, it's because it feels good. Uh, however, when you uh, look at actual behavior, uh, what you find is that uh, decision making uh, is not all that comfortable a process. Uh, if uh, self-interest is really what motivates us, the more options you have, the better you should feel about it. But in fact, uh, that doesn't happen. Uh, <laughs> People, people are challenged by choice, and in the words of a Dutch proverb, uh, he who has choice uh, has trouble. Now, uh, what happens is that this uh, ambivalence about making choices extends very definitely into economic market behavior. People find that trades are uncomfortable, and they often use uh, habit, uh, procrastination, uh, stubbornness to avoid getting to situations where they have to trade or where they have to make a new trading decisions. The psychiatrists even have a word for it, it's agoraphobia, uh, which uh, they use to mean fear of space, but actually means fear of the marketplace. <laughs> now, how, do all, how does all this uh, come about? By the way, I have a few more pretty slides. We can be overwhelmed by choice. Uh, and not all the choices we make are, in fact, <laughs> in our self-interest. Uh, so how does all this come about? By rational calculation, we benefit from trade. Why does it make us uncomfortable? There are three possible answers. One is, while trade is calculated to advance our self-interest, the calculation itself may be burdensome and the cost of mistakes substantial. So we may simply be too lazy to do all the trading that would actually benefit us. A uh, second trade exposes us to opponents who may know more than we do. And I think my colleague uh, George Akerlof will have more to say about that. Uh, uh, so that may justify people being suspicious of trading. 
The third and perhaps most interesting, trade involves social interaction and the emotions that go with social interaction. As a result, we evaluate economic activities both cognitively and viscerally. And emotionally. That is not only, this not only explains why economic choices can make us uncomfortable, but it also explains why we sometimes make systematic mistakes in our choices. Uh, we don't actually approach economic decisions with a single mind. We approach them with a, co uh, a cognitive mind and with a, um, a visceral or emotional mind. But how does all that? How did all this come about? How does how did this emotion get involved in in economic behavior? I'm going to tell you a, an evolutionary tale. A, a few million years ago, the great apes had established family structures that were successful in the essentials: obtaining food, protecting themselves from predators, and reproducing. In common with other animals, they develop uh, they evolved a sense of personal space that was sufficient to provide some defense against attack and a system of trust that allowed them to get close enough, close to family members, close enough to reproduce, for example. Uh, these spatial interactive activities had a physiological basis, reward pathways in the brain and neuromoderators that facilitated these interactions. Uh, a few of these apes discovered through divi that uh, division of labor, specialization, and trade could be could make them more productive. They could live better lives, and they could have more uh, uh, children. But trade, particularly outside the family, was an iffy business. To get close enough to a stranger to trade flints for furs, one had to risk being attacked. And the most successful of these apes dealt with this by developing the ability to form bonds of trust over larger social groups in the family unit. This, in turn, was accomplished by adapting the brain's visceral reward pathways that already allowed family units to function. Second, these apes developed analytic social and communication skills that allowed them to operate in larger social and economic groups. These were cerebral activities and evolution selected species with more cerebral capacity. Among these apes were our, our ancestors. Uh, they gave us large brains with the capacity to explore the corners of our universe and to engage in sophisticated economic activities. They also gave us an emotional reward system that processes economic actions in much the same way that it processes personal interactions when to trust, when to form personal or professional bonds. Uh, this uh, evolutionary tale is apocryphal. What we actually know about the social interactions of our ancestors is limited to uh, a scanty fossil record and the behavior that we observe today in, in other animals. However, the role of trust and reward pathways in the brain and how they affect economic conduct is something that we can study experimentally. And the reason that I have told you about this is that this is one of the new areas of economics that's fascinating to me and uh, I think illustrates how a field can evolve. A field like economics can evolve, make connections with other fields, use ideas from other uh, subjects. For example, a, a team of economists and neurologists uh, in work that was published in Science th uh, this last June asked subjects to play a simple ex economic game. Uh, before they played the game, they were administered different levels of a peptide called oxytocin, which is sometimes called the trust or love hormone, and it's associated with bonding. If you have high levels of this in your uh, in your system, then uh, you tend to trust, you're willing to get closer, your personal space shrinks. The outcome of the game depends on, of uh, this particular game, depends on the degree to which the first player trusts that the second player will respond fairly. And the finding of the economic behavior in this game is that the degree to which one player trusts the second is highly influenced by the level of their treatment of this peptide oxytocin. So, self-interest is modulated by emotional state, and that state is in, in turn susceptible to manipulation. And using that manipulation, uh, 
uh, we can learn more about how you make economic decisions, how your brain works, and of course your auto dealer may figure out to use it to learn how to sell you a, a Hummer. Uh, <laughs> Uh, by the way, uh, this research suggests that since economic trade and sex utilize the same reward pathways in the brain, economics is the sexiest subject in the university. <laughs> but of course, all of you who have taken economic principles already knew that. The uh, uh, Cal University of California is in the education business, not the economic trading business, but education also involves elements of trust. After all, what's more invasive of your, of your personal space than letting someone mess with your brain change the way you think? My guess is that oxytocin levels in Cal classes are quite high. Uh, now that may explain why education is such a rush. In addition to stimulating your cerebrum, it's providing visceral satisfaction. It's sometimes claimed that the most important element in undergraduate education is, in fact, sex. But the message here is that as far as your brain is concerned, sex and education are pretty much the same. Uh, this suggests a possible slogan for the university. Pra practice safe sex, go to class. Let me say in conclusion that even if you're skeptical of this little evolutionary tale and of the claim linkages, linkages between trust economic actions and visceral satisfactions, it, I think it's the case that learning, thinking about, and doing experiments on human and what makes humans tick uh, in the university, in the marketplace, and in social interactions is in fact a rush. You have come to the right place to study these uh, things. And I hope you will enjoy your time here if you're still a student or you enjoy it just coming back. So thank you. Professor Akerlof. Okay. Uh, so I remember winning the Nobel Prize about, I guess it must have been four years ago. And uh, Dan McFadden, who's my neighbor, must have heard me on CBS radio, and he ran up the hill. He said, don't tell them you won the Nobel Prize for buying and selling used cars. <laughs> okay, so I'm not going to tell you that I <laughs> won the Nobel Prize for buying and selling used cars. I think I'm going to tell you uh, about my current project. And um, what I'm doing is a little bit like what Dan was describing. It was a, on bringing new motivation into economic theory and economic analysis. And the work's joined with Rachel Cranton, and she's a PhD from Berkeley from our economics department. So let me tell you a little bit about it. Economic theory and analysis currently center around what's uh, called price theory. You probably all, a lot of you remember that from Economics 1. Price theory focuses on how people respond to monetary in incentives. And its most basic form, the theory holds that when the price is high, people will buy less of a product. And also when the price is high, firms are going to produce more of the product. And so the balance of supply and demand gives the price that's going to prevail in the, mic in the marketplace. So that's what economics is currently gr about a great deal. Price theory is about supply and demand, and economics is about supply and demand. Well, price theory is a good thing. I'll, it's led to some remarkable discoveries. I'll give you one example. Amartya Sin showed that famines were not mainly caused by low harvests and drought. What happens in famines is there's usually more than enough food to, for everyone, but the poor cannot pay the high prices of food uh, when hoarding occurs and then they starve. So that's what happens. Okay, next slide. Okay. So in economics, the way we do economics, technically, is price theory is represented by people having something called a utility function. And these demands and supplies are chosen as bundles of goods and then activities that maximize that function. Now it turns out that, that, that putting that down constitutes a theory of decision making. But it's also a special theory of decision making. By training our sights on monetary incentives, it leads us to miss other motivations that I think are of equal importance. So my current work is to bring in this missing motivation. Now it goes back 100 years ago, 
Uh, as Charlie Towns said, a lot of these are uh, things people have been working on for a great deal of time and the, and the ideas are all there and they're obvious. So as early as the beginning of the 20th century, Vilfredo Pareto pointed out that economists' characterization of utility misses important aspects of motivation. According to Pareto, people typically have opinions as to how they should or how they should not behave. It's very important that you have these opinions. You think how, about how you should behave and how you should not. You also have views, and this is what the gossip columns are full of, about how others should behave and how also how others should not behave. And accordingly, people lose utility insofar as they or others fail to live up to those standards. And such notions are, in fact, central to motivation in sociology, but they've been ignored in economists' representation of utility. Okay, next slide. So I'm going to give some examples of the importance of this missing motivation. Okay. These examples show something that I think, you think about, if you think about them, you'll see that probably you think they're true. They show that people tend to be happy when they live up to how they think they should be, and they tend to be unhappy when they fail to live out how, the, uh, how they think they should be. Let me give you some examples. So George Lowenstein has illustrated this principle by asking why climbers pursue mountaineering. Okay? Now, there are few tasks that are as distant from economists' conventional view of utility as mountaineering. Don't you just think about it. It may be costly, it's arduous, and it's dangerous, and yet people still do it. And one of the primary motivations for the mountaineer is the pleasure of framing a view of who she is, and then having the pleasure of living up to those standards. You know, you climb Annapurna, or you climb Grizzly Peak, and you say, gee, I climb Grizzly Peak, or Annapurna. Um, so let's try a more mundane, mundane example. This is an example that I face most every day. Consider teaching. Teacher, teacher usually has a clear view of what it means to be a good teacher. We think we know. If we live up to that standard, we feel good about ourselves, and if we fall short of that standard, we can even feel quite miserable, and typically we do. So somehow you teach a good class, you're happy, you teach a bad class, well, in the next two days you have to live to make it up. Uh, think about your own activities. The same fe feelings apply to almost any activity, from playing golf to being a parent. It applies to the conduct of most jobs. So Randy Hodson, a sociologist at Ohio State, surveyed ethnographies of the U.S. Uh, workplaces, and this is what he found. He found that most employees care about their dignity at work, and they want to conceive of what they do as useful. And then they feel a lack of dignity if they're thwarted either by their own actions or the actions of others. Those who are unable to get such satisfaction are in fact likely, likely to manifest their displeasure by acting up in some way or other. So let me give you an example of that. There used to be a famous sociologist here at Berkeley, uh, Irving Goffman. And Goffman illustrated the pleasure derived from pursuing an appropriate activity by going up to Tilton Park and going to the merry-go-round. And this is what he saw there. He denoted the delight of the toddlers on their horses. Why were they delighted? Because they were doing what they should do. Okay? But then in contrast, he looked at the older children. And there's a gap between their conception of how they should behave and riding the merry-go-round. For them, the merry-go-round is age inappropriate, and so what they do is they climb onto a frog, they do some kind of joke, they clown around. Basically, they clown around. Okay? Such misbehavior is not just the stuff of kids. So Goffman also went to surgical operations, and he observed what medical students do uh, in surgical operations. Now, if you're doing a surgical operation, you don't give the best task to the medical students who are new there. You give them very easy tasks. But they respond in the same way as the older children do with the merry-go-round. They simply act the clown. Okay. So these examples are illustrative. They're illustrative behavior that is pervasive. And sociology is simply dense in examples of people's views as to how they and others should behave. It describes their joy when they live up to those standards and their discomfort and reactions when they fa fail to do so. Okay, so that's the motivation that we're bringing into economics, okay? So where does that take us? 
To obtain an economic theory that incorporates such motivation, what we do is we go back to the utility function. Remember that we represent utility function where people care to live up to how they think that they and others should or should not behave. And this is going to give us a richer, better field of economics. So I'm going to give you eight examples where this makes a difference for this last slide. Okay, the first and the easiest <coughs> is in the economics of gender. Gender discrimination <coughs> is mainly about the views <coughs> that men should do some tasks and women should do other tasks in the workplace. That's not the usual interpretation of gender discrimination in legal cases. That usual view is the most gender discrimination is sexual harassment. But there's a movement among legal scholars to acknowledge that inappropriate association of tasks with gender is in fact the basis of most gender discrimination. And incorporation of this view changes the economic model and the legal interpretation of gender discrimination. I'll say that's one. Two, the economics of minority poverty. Katrina has pointed out to us what we all know, very visually. This is the shocking problem of minority poverty. Now there are two sides to that poverty. The first side is whites failure to accept minorities as equals. But there's also the opposite side of the mirror. Sociologists have described how difficult it is to accept cultures that did not accept your own. And if it is not your culture that controls the jobs and the power, that has serious side effects. The Berkeley anthropologist John Ogbu was a leading exponent of the importance of such a cause for minority poverty. He also made innovative recommendations for what to do about it. So his views are now standard in sociology, but they're still foreign to economists' understanding of the causes of minority poverty. And that's one of the things that this brings, that our new view brings into uh, economics. So the economics of education, item three. Economists believe that educational attainment is determined by students weighing of the objective costs against the objective benefits of getting more education. But in our view, much of these costs and benefits are subjective, not objective. They occur because students know that the additional education is going to change who they are. Students then ask whether or not that is who they want to be. So this theory explains neatly why many students drop out early. They drop out early even though the returns to education are so very high. It especially, especially explains the reason why there are so few students, even in a university such as ours, from disadvantaged backgrounds. Furthermore, it also tells us what's needed to make uh, schools effective. Good schools, unlike bad schools, actively change who students want to be. This perspective transforms the economics of education. And there's a cadre of education scholars who believe that adoption of this perspective should be used to change American education. And so what we're doing is bringing into this, into the economics of ed education. There's a field known as household economics. Okay? This theory accounts for choices regarding marriage and divorce, and also how household tasks are divided within a marriage. It says that people make such decisions based upon the cost and the benefits. But just think about one example of this. Let's think about divorce. A major determinant of divorce is that men and women have different images. They have different images of how men and women respectively should or should not behave. Diverging views of men and women as to how their mates should or should not behave are a major factor in the rising divorce rate. You can see such divergence in any survey of high school students. Just ask them what they think should be the role of the wife and the husband. And the shocking thing is when you see such uh, surveys that there's such a remarkable res uh, diversity of response between the men and the women. And that just predicts the divorces that we now see. There's a leading expert in this field with some of the best examples and that's Arlie Hochschild in the uh, Berkeley Department of Sociology. Okay, so the economics of organizations. Okay. Economists' view of what makes organizations work is that the employees should be given the right monetary incentives. You should pay people the right wages for doing the right tasks and give people the right promotions. Our view is that what makes organizations work is that people identify with their jobs or with their organizations. That means 
that the way they take a job in their organization, they should have a constructive view as to what they should do. Remember, that's what this thing is all about. It's how people's view of what they should do is going to be the motivation. So incentives may play some role in the success or failure of organizations, but Rachel Cranton and I think that employees' views of what they should or should not do plays a much bigger role. So this gives a new view uh, to economists of organizational behavior. Let me give you a practical example where it could play a role. It should give a different picture of the proper legal structure for corporate regulation. This new view emphasizes the role of fiduciary responsibility. And it's opposite, just to give you another example, to the philosophy of corporate law that gave us Sarbanes-Oxley, which is just a tremendous and unnecessary burden for almost every corporate corporate uh, executive and is probably costing us a good share of US GDP. Give you example six on the list, public finance. Our view of behavior explains why tax collection in the United States is as successful as it is. It would gut the US tax system if all taxpayers interpreted all the gray areas strictly in their favor. But most people pay their taxes honestly. Why do they do that? They think th that this is what they should do and that's what makes the, ta the US tax system work and be as successful as it is. Economics and politics. Uh, so economists talk about politics and there's an economic theory of politics. Economists argue that voting is costly, yet very rarely are elections uh, won or lost by a single vote. And because, you know, it costs, it's a nuisance to go to the poll and because nobody, seldom are elections won by a single vote, uh, they think it is a mystery why people take the trouble to vote. We don't, I don't think it's a mystery of all, at all. In our view, it's no mystery because pe people's views as to how they should behave explains why they vote. Most of us who are non-economists believe we should vote and that's why we go to the poll and we actually take a little bit of pleasure in doing so because we feel we've done the right thing. It also explains why people vote as they do, when they do. Sometimes people even vote against their own economic interests. I'll give you just one example of that. Prime example of that is opposition to the estate tax. Surprisingly, there are a very large number of people who are opposed to the estate tax, even those those people know that they'll never pay a single dime of that. Okay, finally, it takes us to where we are right here in this room. Think about our great university. The reason that we are such a great institution is because students, alumni, faculty, staff, administrators, legislators, and citizens of California care so deeply about Cal. That's what makes this institution work. So I want to thank everybody here for coming to this homecoming event, and this is just one of the many ways in which you and other members of the Cal family support our fine institution. So thanks a lot. We have time for a few questions. If uh, there are questions, please raise your hand. And there are people with microphones who will um, who will come around. This is for uh, Dr. Glazer. Um, you said that uh, giving either alcohol or marijuana tended to make the people not see the rotation in the picture. And you explain this by the fact that the there was less noise due to the drug, but. Could it also be interpreted to mean it's not less noise, but rather it's messing up the nervous system, missing something that's really there? How do you know the difference between those two interpretations? You have just come to the frontier of our research. <laughs> Uh, and so the uh, hypothesis that we're testing is whether the noise, which is inevitable, we have a hundred billion neurons, and each neuron is sending out signals at the rate of maybe 10 or 20 or 30 little voltage spikes per second. So the inside of our brain must be like an enormous untuned television set. And our job is to somehow fix it so we aren't disturbed by that and can f pull out the relevant part of those signals. And the uh, pictures that I described, in some, the, the fact that you see motion which isn't there, is one of those rare special cases in which the noise does have an effect. 
and now we're trying to prove that that's true. Uh, there is a uh, rather fancy mathematical analysis called stochastic resonance, which uh, uh, would explain how that might work. And our job is now to try to show stochastic resonance, which is commonly used nowadays in engineering, to improve the performance of noisy circuits and see whether the brain uses the same tricks. Come back in a year and I'll tell you if it does. <laughs> Thank you. Can we get a microphone in the front row? I'd like to ask any of the laureates, uh, after you win a Nobel Prize, what do you do for an encore? <laughs> you keep working. Well, I think the Nobel Prize frequently slows up research because you become a semi-public figure, people think you're more important than you are and uh, get called on and so on, it takes time. So it, it tends to uh, slow up slow up research. But most of us keep going and uh, enjoy it and uh, uh, try to do something new. <laughs> I think um, at least three of us um, we all went into new areas, new fields, in fact. And I actually started going into new area about um, uh, eight years before the Nobel Prize and was warned by my colleagues in physics, don't do this. Why? Well, you've got to leave your scent so they'll remember you. Uh, and the new area was actually spawned by the original research. Uh, the ability to hold on to atoms led to the ability to hold on to individual cells, led to uh, uh, my work to hold on to individual biomolecules and then to use that technique and other techniques to understand the machinery of life at the molecular level in a really physics basis and so it's just a whole new area. I, I think the real motivation for most of the people here was, is the excitement of the hunt, the, the look for something that hasn't been found before, something new. And so the Nobel Prize, a parking space, so that's all just icing on the cake. <laughs> Yeah, that's why I wanted to explain what I was working on now, somehow, as opposed to what I won the prize for. Somehow I wanted to show that I, I'm doing something that at least I'm excited about. <laughs> Gentlemen in the second row, if uh, you can, can you get to a microphone, or can a microphone get to him? This is a question in the floor, uh, Professor McFadden. Could you comment on the relation between uh, economics and uh, psychology? It uh, seems that uh, your work in the past has touched this topic. I would like to see a little bit of elaboration. Well, uh, briefly, uh, the economists ignored the psychologists for a long time, although if you go back 200 years, uh, a lot of the people were philosophers who thought of themselves variously as economists and psychologists. But uh, the, the core of economics in the 20th century uh, largely thought it knew how to explain what people did without having to resort to psychology. I think the, the, what we see now, the, the, the exciting new areas in economics uh, are, are the result of breaking down that, uh, that barrier and recognizing that while traditional economics explains a lot and is a pretty powerful theory because it's such a sparse theory, uh, nevertheless it doesn't explain everything and these, these emotions matter. Um, yes, woman back there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I have a question for you as an undergrad student who is um, pursuing research at the moment. But um, when you look at a young student who wants to do research and wants to work with you, what are the traits, or what do you, what sets one student apart from the other? I mean, how do you take on a grad student on board? Or, um, is, this directed to is that directed to, to any yeah, to particular? You, anyone want to take it? <laughs> Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, actually, some of the qualities that uh, Don Glazer talked about, uh, the most important is uh, the fire in the belly. You really want to find answers to some things. You're, you're really driven by your curiosity and, and, and we're willing to focus on that and, and excited about that more than anything else. I, I think this differs by field. So in economics, people enter the, the graduate program. You get in independently. And then I think that uh, 
that students look for professors and typically if anyone who asks, we say yes. <laughs> Okay. Yes, sir. I have a question about this fact that uh, looks to me that most of the great laureates of physics or uh, economy are spending time on important things, but I wanted to know that uh, why they have abandoned the field of uh, uh, something like uh, cold fusion, which has a lot to do with economy and say magnetic charge and say uh, universal forces uh, getting together, prove it. So uh, I was just wondering that is going to astrophysics is more important than solving a problem of cold fusion? Well, uh, <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Uh, so, um, well, it, let's broaden it from solving the problem of cold fusion to solving the energy problem uh, and getting and, and developing, doing the science to develop the science that will lead to technologies that will allow us to have sustainable CO2 neutral energy sources. Uh, and I think, um, I think times are changing, the many of us, including my, actually myself, are becoming increasingly <coughs> interested in this because it is such an important problem. Uh, for all of society to, to deal with that. And uh, there's going to be a lot of beautiful science on the way. And, and I think you're going to see a lot of scientists aiming their guns at, at that issue. Yes, sir. It's very nice to hear Professor Chu and Professor Tanner mention at and Bell Labs. And uh, so that means a part of all this research was supported by uh, private industry. Now, given that the glory of Bell Lab is gone, can you imagine or envision any other private research institute such as Bell Labs for the future? Yes, uh, I think, well, first, uh, it doesn't have to be private. I mean, one of my goals is to get Lawrence Berkeley National Lab to fill some of that vacuum. Uh, there's other institutes. There's um, a new institute, the Howard Hughes, um, found by the Howard Hughes and supported by Howard Hughes Foundation called Janella Farms, which is an interdisciplinary research institute that brings together a lot of people, in, in, but centered around biological problems, um, where where you could bring in people, give them some money, and say go, and encourage them to, to take high risks. Uh, and the only proof of taking high risks is you've got to fail. Uh, and so there, there are attempts to recreate Bell Labs in, in various places. Uh, I think that is, at least personally, a terrible personal loss. It's, and I think to all the people who spent significant time at Bell Labs, we, we really feel this. It was such a wonderful place when I joined in 78. Um, uh, they hired only young people. Uh, and they grew the talent. They didn't hire stars. Um, when I was hired in a two or three year period, there were maybe three or four dozen people, maybe 40-ish people that were hired. Uh, and five of us got Nobel Prizes. And about a third to half of all those people are now in the National Academy of Sciences. It was a spectacular place. Well, I know that there are many of you who still have questions for our speakers. Why don't you come out into the lobby for the reception and you'll have an opportunity to talk to them.